Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a uh, more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. And welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast between books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And on this episode, we are discussing our November 2021 book club pick, On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vong, which was a heck of a book to read for the month of November. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, uh, I would like we haven't really read poetry for Books and Boba. We've read books by poets and um we read novels and memoirs by poets and um i would say they have a very distinct style of of prose and i i don't think that's an exception for yeah. ocean i mean ocean's book is kind of a amalgamation of all of those it's not quite a memoir but it's also not quite a novel too it's kind of like a mix of everything well it is a novel physically but like um, it's kind of just in its own space category, it is, right? Yeah, yeah. I would say, like, out of all of the books we've read, this was definitely the most poetic book because of like the unique category that it straddles. Yeah. So I guess let's just get right into it. Um, we'll we'll have more of a catch up with Rira, um, in our next episode because if you might notice, her her voice is a little low key right now because oh, yeah. she's just gone through what four four days of BTS. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Which, congratulations for surviving. It was the best week and also the most stressful week of my life. Uh, Yeah, we'll catch up with Rira more about her experience with the BTS on our next episode. But (laughs) um, yeah, let's get into our book club discussion. Uh, Rira, can you start us off with the book jacket description? Yeah, sure. On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous is a letter from a son to a mother who cannot read. Written when the speaker, Little Dog, is in his late 20s, the letter unearths a family's history that began before he was born, a history whose epicenter is rooted in Vietnam and serves as a doorway into parts of his life his mother has never known, all of it leading to an unforgettable revelation. At once a witness to the fraught yet undeniable love between a single mother and her son, it is also a brutally honest exploration of race, class, and masculinity— Asking questions central to our American moment, immersed as we are in addiction, violence, and trauma, but underguarded by compassion and tenderness. Uh, So as um, I've said in the book jacket description, uh, some content warnings, there is uh, 
trauma, there is drug addiction, there is domestic violence, uh, mentions of PTSD, schizophrenia, and cancer. So if any of those are triggers for you, please go in with caution. Yeah, we talked a lot about how Ocean's book is very poetic and beautiful, but it's also very visceral and um, trying to like, I don't have the language skills of an Ocean Vong, so I can't um, (laughs) draw the the right metaphor. But a lot of his descriptions, especially the ones that evoke violence both in like domestic violence also in sexual violence is very like it affects you in like a very um visceral way yeah i would say it's like the the closest description that i can come up with is raw like you really feel it when you're reading the prose uh i don't know there's something like very like painful yet beautiful about the prose which you know kind of ties in with the theme uh, of of the book, which is like finding beauty within ugliness and accepting other people's flaws and learning how to accept their love. Um, so yeah, like it kind of ties in with the themes. Yeah. When I was reading the book, it took me a while to realize, actually it wasn't until I started reading some supplemental materials that I realized it was not a memoir. For some reason I thought it was I can understand that assumption because largely it is based on Ocean Vong's uh, life. Um, Like he also grew up in a single mother, uh, grandmother family. His father uh, left them. Um, He also worked on a tobacco farm and uh, he went to college for business school, but he dropped out after three weeks and uh, turned to poetry um there's a lot of similarities so i would say the book is very much a memoir that is heightened into fiction so it's reimagined in a way where it provides a little bit of distance for the writer yeah and it's written in such a um interesting way it's a what what's the genre called like epistolary um, epistolary Epistolary, yes. I added an extra syllable there. Again, not not myself an English major like Rira or Ocean. I'm not an English major. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's written as a letter to his mother. Although, what did you think about the way it was written? Because it is presented as a letter, but also as a stream of consciousness type of thing. Like it jumps in time a lot between sections. And mm-hmm. it's a letter that the main character, Little Dog, is writing to his mother that he doesn't believe his mother will ever read so it actually becomes more like a confessional right he's like burying his his soul and his heart out on the page and it kind of just becomes his confessional right here are all the thoughts that i have about my relationship with you with our home with our country with people that we we grew up around yeah um his mom is never going to read the letter because she is illiterate uh both in vietnamese and in english so there is no way that she could read it and towards the end of the book, um, she mentions how like she's tired and she you know, doesn't want to learn how to read. She just wants to rest um, because she's lived a very hard life. And it is kind of like a confessional. Um, I think the reason why it's so fractured and it jumps from time to time is because the speaker little dog is trying to process through very painful memories and trauma and kind of like learning how to articulate like what he went through which can also be like a very fractured process um it's very reminiscent of like uh healing through trauma in therapy (laughs) so um that's what i got out of the the format and also the book is split into three parts but there's no title for those parts uh it's just roman numerals one two and three um and it's kind of loosely separated i would say like part one is mostly about like uh like the vietnam war the american occupation how that affects uh, affected his family and then part two is more about like his uh sexual uh awakening and uh, reconciling with his queer identity and masculinity and the third part is about death and learning how to um 
accept the ugliness with the beauty of his relationship with his mom and also uh, his grandmother who has schizophrenia. Yeah, I in my notes, I wrote, you know, act one is about origins, right? Where they came from, how they got here. You know, act two is identity. It's kind of like a coming of age of sorts. He's discovering his identity and kind of coming to his own um, as like, you know, as a teen. And then act three, death, right? He describes the death of not only Trevor, his first love, but also his grandmother and how like death is really all around them throughout their lives, even though they're out of a war zone. I thought that was mm, really yeah. affecting. Um, war trauma, specifically like Vietnam, um, war trauma is, at least for us, not a new thing. Like we've read other books about it. I feel like a good companion piece to this book would actually be T. Bowie's graphic memoir, um, The Best We Could Do, mm-hmm. um, because that also describes like how generational war trauma affects the refugees, even after they've escaped the war zone. And I wonder for how many people, because this book is like award-winning, right? It is one of those books that kind of crossed over into like the mainstream, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because like Ocean Vuong, uh, his 2016 poetry collection, Night Sky with Exit Wounds, uh, it won like a couple of awards. It won the T.S. Eliot Prize and the Whiting Award. Uh, which are very um, notable prizes. And his novel, I think it actually got picked up for um, like a screen adaptation recently. Yeah, Bing Lu, the director of Mind in the Gap, is attached to direct. It's going to be an A24 joint, so you know it's going to be you know, artsy and profound, which I think is a good a good vibe oh, for yeah. this book. Uh, I feel like it would be very difficult to adapt. Like I am very curious on how they're going to work with the form if it's going to be linear or if they're going to mirror like the uh meandering long braided essay form that this book has um uh yeah but this was one of the most anticipated novels in when was this was it was it 2019 yes uh so it was one of the most anticipated novels of 2019 because of uh, his work with his poetry. Um, I'm pretty sure that this book was also nominated for the National Book Award. Uh, So yeah, it has definitely crossed into the mainstream, kind of like Min Jin Lee's Pachinko. Yeah. And I wonder how many, for how many people, probably most people reading this book, this would be their first, I guess, exposure to like the refugee immigrant narrative. Yeah. um, I mean, like, the refugee experience, like you said, it's not new to Asian American literature. Um, we read How to Pronounce Knife not that long ago, and it's very similar in terms of like uh, describing how there is a ripple effect in trauma and uh, the harshness of working in a nail salon, for example. But I think what this book does really well is taking history and personalizing it and making it really like making you feel it really in your heart. And I think for a lot of people who are unfamiliar with uh, like the American occupation in Vietnam and how that really affected uh, refugees, um, it's, it's a book that will, I guess, like question, like give them questions on like, how we affected these people's lives and um i don't know just put like a name and a face to the pain um yeah so it's like not like a history book and it's definitely not a book that's like just about trauma um i think it's a lot of things which is kind of reflective of being an Asian American, because you're not just, you know, the byproduct of war and trauma. Like you have your own baggage. Um, like, like little dog is going through um, a very painful process of learning, like what it means to be queer and like what it means to be in a relationship with a white boy who has toxic masculinity <laughs> and living in a neighborhood where drug addiction and there's like a opioid uh, crisis. So it's a lot of things. I mean, I wonder if that isn't also trauma, right? Like something that I noted is that this book 
is not all about generational war trauma, but it is about trauma of, of all sorts, right? Like the trauma of being an American, especially a refugee American, right? You have that war trauma, but you also have like the trauma of being queer in America. You have the trauma of being poor in America. And like being an intersectionally marginalized person is just constantly living in in that trauma, right? Yeah, there's a quote that I really liked that kind of like sums up that message and it's, let no one mistake us for the fruit of violence, but rather that violence having passed through the fruit fail to spoil it. So yes, we all go through violence and trauma in our lives, but you know, we survived and that's something to be celebrated. But yeah, like it's really hard to discuss this book. Um, I remember when I was reading it, I wish I had slowed down my pace because mm. I read this book within two days and I really that's a lot. <laughs> should, I really should have like taken a week to like savor the prose um, because it's definitely not something that you can power through. And I didn't mean to power through it. It just, you know, I have a very fast reading speed and um, which is probably why like me and poetry don't mix very well a lot of the times because I'm all about like action and conflict <laughs> and I don't really do well with a uh, stream of consciousness and with prose like this, it requires you to slow down, really think about it, let it like sink in. And I'm just really impatient. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been a while since we've read like a, not to say the other books that we've read aren't like literary, but like a, a like a capital L literary, like this is a book that you get assigned in the class, you pour through and analyze every single line for meaning and metaphor and, and all that. And I feel like um, it does remind you of like sitting through a spoken word piece where you just want to like, you know, snap your fingers after every line because he does drop a lot of really dope lines in this entire book. Yeah, yeah. I like highlighted a lot of quotes that I read in the book um, and like just how visceral it is. Like uh, when he's describing his grandmother's hands, uh, I wrote it down here, uh, hands so thick and black with sap, dirt, pebbles and splinters. They resembled the bottom of a pan of burned rice. <laughs> it's like so specific, so descriptive. And you just, you know, like it's so tricky to get that kind of descriptive prose and if no one told me that Ocean Vuong was a poet, you could really tell, like, right off the get-go that um, he's a poet. And On Earth, um, We're Briefly Gorgeous is actually a title of a poem that he wrote in his previous collection. Mm -hmm. I have not read that poem, so I don't know how much it, like, is related to this book. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, I thought the title was really fitting, too. Yeah, it invokes like the transient nature of life, I guess. And you know, throughout the book, he does use the metaphor of monarch butterflies a lot. And monarch butterflies are kind of like a transient form of beautiful life, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're someone like me who's like impatient and you know, like to read books that have a lot of um, like momentum, because like I'm I'm not all about like action either, but like. Like, I usually read thinking, like, okay, where is this going? Like, where is the yeah, art? Yeah, yeah, this is definitely not, this is definitely it's a book not that one you, of those books. You, you need to sit and think about each line. And I, I kind of, I had the same feeling, too, because I read this book over this past week. I was like, man, I really should have started this earlier. But then I would have had, like, 10 pages of notes, and this would be, like, a 10-hour episode. So no one wants that, either. <laughs> I also, like, was like you said, like this is the type of book that you would read in class and kind of like analyze like line by line. And like I was just thinking about the books that I read in like high school, college and like broke down and they were all by dead white guys. Yeah. And, you know, like a lot of those white guys were not poor. They came from like upper middle class or uh, aristocracy. And, you know, it's nice that in the capital L canon we have a book by like a vietnamese refugee who comes from uh who has family who is illiterate and it's just something that 
seems so American, but at the same time, like so different from what we are used to in capital L literature. So I was like, yeah, like, I would love to, if I was a high school student, I would rather read this over Leaves of Grass. Oh my God, so many poets who are listening to this episode right now are just like, what do you mean? Leaves of Grass is amazing. Well, sorry. Like when I read that in high school, I was just like, I did not appreciate it. <laughs> so, Yeah, there's something about, um, A, this is a story that, and while it doesn't reflect our own experiences, it reflects the experiences of friends that we know of right who are from these refugee communities and families and i feel like i can relate to those stories the stories of like war trauma because my like actually both our grandparents probably grew up in times of constant war and that has definitely affected the way our parents were raised and how we were raised right so we could i mean i can relate to that more than like transcendentalism yeah true (laughs) true I know that like a lot of people who probably read this book are just like, wow, the mom is terrible because you see a lot of instances where uh, abuse happens and it is explicit. But um, I think there's a line in the book. I I don't remember because I don't have it with me right now, but it was about like how he called his mom a monster, but he is also a monster, too. And I thought that was like really poignant because um, in the book, I don't think there are any villains because everybody is really messed up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's Uh. like you like it's just like, yeah, the mom is abusive, but it, you know, like in a very difficult way, you kind of reconcile the fact that, yeah, abuse happens, but she also loves her son and she would do like anything for him and like kind of understand that like she is mentally ill and there's just like a lot of things going on. Yeah. So you can't really say, oh, this person is like all bad. It reminds me of and we're kind of also out of chronological order here because we recorded a interview with Julie too, the author of The Donut Trap, a couple of days ago. But the episode will release after this episode. But we talked to her about her book, um, which involves relationships with immigrant parents from a refugee community who just don't understand why their children do certain things. And, you know, she mentioned that her her test readers all thought the parents were terrible. But for us reading that book and reading this book, I feel like while we recognize that the actions were wrong, we also recognize those answers as something that we've also kind of we can understand and we've probably lived through. And Mm -hmm. not to excuse domestic violence in terms of like moral grounds. It's wrong and it shouldn't happen. But it's something that I think a lot of us children of immigrants can recognize because it is a result of not only like mental illness and trauma, but also of like just clashing cultural values. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you when you're older, definitely when you're like at your parents age, when they came to this country, like you realize how hard it was (laughs) for them. And you know, it's it's not excusing them. And like, I've had this conversation with like my mom and my dad. And, you know, it's kind of like saying what you did to me was terrible. It was abuse. But like, I understand where you came from. So, you know, it, it's not really forgiveness. It's more like acceptance, I would say, yeah. in like the most like basic way. <laughs> I mean, that line you dropped. I remember that line jumping out to me as well because, you know, if you think about it, our parents may seem monstrous to us because we don't understand what they value and what we value are fundamentally different, but that affects us in a physical way. But at the same time, what we are becoming is also alien and monstrous to them as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the story of his grandmother, Lan, was very painful but cinematic and like it's so i don't know how to describe it but it's like you know the story like you've seen enough movies where like you see like a vietnamese woman with a baby trying to survive and you know becoming a bar girl it's like a very typical story you say that but all the movies that depict that are from the perspective of the white soldiers (laughs) <laughs> yes, that's yeah, but it's just like it's a story that is typical, but also it's 
it's just so personal. And like Lan, you know, running away at 17 from an arranged marriage and, um, and eventually like getting pregnant, but the, the birth dad like disappears and, you know, she finds her way to America and Paul, uh, an American soldier that she kind of bonded with in, in Saigon. Kind of becomes, in Saigon. Like, yeah. And married yeah. in Saigon. And, um, she finds out later that he, uh, got married to an American woman, but like, that was like after the war had happened and they didn't really know what happened to each other. And it's like, yeah, these are stories that are very familiar to me, but like I keep saying, like it was very personalized and I was just like, yeah, I feel this like, (laughs) um, typical story, but impact is very powerful. Yeah. I mean, these are stories, even if you have like friends from with those types of experiences, it's hard even for them to get those stories from their parents, from their grandparents, right? Because no one wants to talk about these things. I mean, part of the reason why they became refugees was to start over. So um, getting like a, you know, even if it's slightly fictionalized, but getting this type of perspective, it is something that we don't hear a lot about, especially in mainstream media. Like, like we were mentioning, like we've seen the depictions of, you know, the Vietnamese woman with a child on the middle of the street, but we never really know their stories, right? It's, it's a trope and it's, it's world mm-hmm. used as like setting, but we rarely in mainstream media get to explore those stories. So I liked reading the uh, passages with Lon, the main character's grandmother. I mean, I, I like reading the book in, in general. I mean, the whole first part was kind of everyone's origins, right? Not only the grandmother, but also the mother, right? Like she was the product of a white and Vietnamese mom. So she could pass as white, but her language was still very rudimentary, right? Like I think in that first part is when Ocean described like our mother tongues as refugees, as immigrants, as an orphan, right? Especially with this mother who, because she didn't finish school, right? Her her schoolhouse was bombed when she was in what, like first grade or something? Like she never finished school. So her, not only is her English not good, but also her Vietnamese is very rudimentary and basic as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, I really loved how another main theme of the, the novel was language and the power of language. The narrator is someone who studies language, but he's also very conscious aware that the better he becomes at writing at English, the further he is from his mother. Yeah, there's a power that. dynamic there. Because, like, once, like, if he teaches his mother language, he becomes the teacher, the the person who is more powerful in that relationship. And his mom doesn't want that. And uh, that's, yeah, that's like a thought that doesn't really pop up a lot in in Asian American literature, I think. I mean, like, it, we touch upon it, but it was, like, so specific in the book for uh, Ocean to point out. Yeah, uh, I did enjoy this. It, it wasn't funny, but I think he meant it to be a little humorous. But the, Oh, I know the, which scene you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, the scene that started him on the path of, like, I want to be good at language, which is the oxtail scene, right, where um, the family is at a supermarket trying to buy oxtail for oxtail soup, but no one knows how to say oxtail and so you know in in the scene they start miming it and then basically the whole butchering staff kind of just laughs at them yeah Um, it is humorous but also like very very sad right there's another scene where they're at a department store i think it was a department store and like one of the workers come up to uh rose the mom saying like oh like is is this like your son is he adopted thinking that uh rose is like a white woman and then um upon realizing that she has like very broken english um the son little dog is like i came out from my mom's asshole and (laughs) like i was just like okay um i mean that was like a humorous moment but also it just kind of showed that uh little dog wants to protect his mom and language is one way to provide a shield to to his mom and i think that's like 
also a very common experience for um, children of immigrants. We like we learn language so we can like help out our parents navigate this weird country. Yeah, I mean, I don't personally have this experience because my my dad is actually pretty pretty good with English, but. I know plenty of friends who are their parents' IT support and also the person who calls the credit card companies and cable companies for them. And make doctor's appointments, yeah. 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 I live that life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like when I when I immigrated to the States, I was three years old and I still have memories of like uh, my mom saying like, you need to learn English fast because your dad is too busy with work and you know, you are the oldest, so you need to, like, know how to speak English so that I can, like, help you um, at school and whatnot. So, yeah, that experience is, like, is mine and also a lot of Asian American children. I think, like, an experience that I had that was, like, kind of similar to, um, to, like, kind of standing up to, like, a white person to protect uh, your parent was um like i remember like my mom had like a parking ticket but she didn't understand like what it was <laughs> and like there was a cop and he was being like very aggressive and mm. you know he was just like why don't you speak english and i was like i can speak english and i'm like six years old and i'm <laughs> like listen sir <laughs> we were only 10 minutes late like why do you have to give us a ticket it was yeah, yeah. but um yeah, I thought that was like a cute scene with, with like the miscommunication. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another observation that he makes about language that I thought was was pretty cool was his observation that like Americans specifically like using very violent terms to signify success. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you're killing yeah. it, you smash that. And I thought when I was reading, I was thinking, yeah, we do do that. Yeah, we? yeah. I didn't really realize that at uh, as well, oh, I know it's yeah. been so ingrained into us, right? To associate um, murdering something as doing really, really good. Um, Speaking of like, like toxic masculinity, um, I was about to bring that up. Yeah, but yeah go ahead. Um, what did you think about the Trevor storyline? Like, Trevor is the white farm boy who Little Dog meets while working at a tobacco farm, who becomes kind of his first. Um, his first love right? his first boyfriend um and it is through trevor that he both explores his sexuality but also his relationship to to violence yeah and to drugs as yeah. well it was definitely something new to read for me um because we like we don't get a lot of queer asian americans in like capital l <laughs> literature um and also, like the the sex scenes were much more graphic than yeah. I expected it to be, and I totally understand why Ocean put that in because this is a book about trauma and difficult memories and working through it. And I appreciated the fact that uh, the sex wasn't like super flowery; it was like it's very awkward. Yeah, and, I was like, very yeah. surprised to read pages plural of of the sex scene um i was not expecting it and it was yeah it was very like it was very visceral and i I definitely did not expect it to happen again in part three yeah i mean there was a part where i think it was like the first time where uh they kind of experimented with like sexual activities um when little dog looks at the mirror and he realizes like how like beautiful he is after such like a like an explicit act and you know like it kind of reminded me of how much like for most of the time we don't realize like how we're desired or i guess we're i guess like we don't know how the outside world sees us so Finding beauty within ourselves is very difficult. And I thought that scene was pretty poignant. Yeah. I mean, part of that is just the results of, again, that trauma of being poor and marginalized, right? He spent his entire life trying to be as small and invisible as possible, 
right? There's that passage in part two where he's talking about the word sorry and how sorry is synonymous with, with being poor. Like mm-hmm. being sorry is a state of being poor, like always apologizing for, for existing. And, you know, while his relationship with Trevor Probably not the most healthy relationship. Oh, yeah, definitely (laughs) not. Trevor has a lot of toxic masculinity issues. And yeah, it it, like definitely shows in the pros. (laughs) But it definitely allowed him to observe and reflect and process those um, those concepts. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, Little Dog's relationship with Trevor, it mirrors his relationship with his mom, right? Like, this is someone who he allows to do stuff to him in return for i mean affection affection I guess. or yeah affection or the idea of, of affection right yeah um and also just the relationship with trevor spans years so it's not something that mm, yeah it's is not like a summer a clear, fling right yeah it's not a clear cut relationship which you know, makes sense because all of the relationships in this book are blurred, uh, <laughs> either by violence or just trauma or history. And um, Trevor is white. So I, I kind of wish that the book went into the, I guess, like power dynamic of that, because you do get the power dynamic of of Trevor being someone who has this very strict idea of masculinity, like he refuses um to you know have sex in a way where he doesn't want to be a top yeah like pretty much like like he says in the prose like oh i don't want to be the bitch and you know that's very yeah yeah i don't know how i could describe that because i was just like wow like why are you with this guy because he's terrible but at the same time he came from a poor family and you know he has a drug addiction so honestly he has his own painful metamorphosis that he's going through yeah i mean i feel like the white privilege of trevor is inferred right it's not explicit but it is inferred but he's definitely someone who is used to wielding power and domination in terms of uh, people who are in the same economic class because yeah. of his whiteness. And you see that in like the tobacco farm yeah. scenes. Yeah, I mean, his dad's kind of a piece of crap, but his grandfather owns a farm slash plantation, right? Yeah, and then like, you know, the people who work the tobacco farms, you know, they're in this position to help better uh, the lives of their family outside the country, whether it's to pay for their medical bills or to save up for a house. And, you know, like, Trevor, his grandfather owns the farm and he does have an actual I mean it's like a mobile home but it's still like property whereas a uh, little dog lives in an apartment and yeah. yeah it just shows that the power dynamics and hierarchy of being poor like it's tied to race as well yeah even within being poor there's still a hierarchy but even with that power Trevor still can escape the the drama of being poor, right? And eventually succumbs to it when he overdoses on um, Oxycontin and um, fentanyl, right? Yeah, yeah. Trevor kind of reminds me of... I feel like everybody has this relationship with someone who wasn't really good for you, but they helped you find your identity or at least like pointed you towards the right path to finding your identity uh with little dog and trevor like he finds out that he's queer and what that means and uh what it means to be in a relationship where the power dynamic is a little bit tilted um and like of course like first sexual experiences like like it's awkward it's messy (laughs) (laughs) But like I feel like everybody has that one person in their life that really impacted them. And it's not sometimes they're not people who were good and they did cause trauma on you, but at the same time they helped you change. And that's kind of what Trevor reminded me of. Um so yeah, even though he I don't know, like throughout the when I was reading the book, I was like, why is there so much Trevor? And I was kind of expecting him to disappear much sooner. But it makes sense that he 
was woven throughout the entire book because, you know, he did leave such an impact on Little Dog. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about the third part, which is um, about the death of Trevor and also his grandmother? And like death is the recurring theme of that third part. I honestly don't know. It was sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the book that was already not like happy times all throughout. It's, you know, the third part really like you knew it was coming, right? Um, both mm-hmm. Tre- Trevor as someone who was always living on that razor's edge and Grandma Lon, who was already old. And, and had cancer. Had can- and yeah. had schizophrenia. <laughs> yeah, and who was always talked about in like the past tense, also in the, the first two parts. Um, but I think it was especially sad when Lon passed away because even though uh, Rose and Lon were both illiterate, like Lon told stories to Little Dog, and that you know that helped him become someone who wanted to learn language and wanted to become a writer. And it just shows that like Lon was really instrumental in in like him loving storytelling. And you know, like we were talking earlier about how a lot of like refugee parents they don't really talk about the experiences that they went through but i feel like with lon it was very different (laughs) like she talked a lot about her experiences and she told it in like a very fictionalized heightened way kind of like how this memoir slash fiction is yeah and the passages that he dedicates to lon's final moments were also very like just as visceral as those you know those sex scenes where he describes her final moments in like really great detail and you can feel the raw emotions coming not only from from little dog but also his mom um and his as, aunt. yeah as as lon passes away yeah like it's very rare for books that describe a a death scene to like go into the nitty gritty details of like bod like bodily fluids of like you know um like cleaning up someone's feces with like rubber gloves and like uh after lon passes away rose tries to put uh her dentures back in but because of rigor mortis and dentures like pop out like these are details that don't really show up in literary death scenes they tend to be like beautified in a way and it was nice to see that it wasn't there's something to be said about describing these very raw and visceral scenes in such a beautiful way um yeah but reading the last section was i would say that was probably like the most painful part for for me to read more painful than than like the first part where it was like talking about the ripple effect of of like generational trauma and trauma of the war yeah i mean i think part of that is just um you know, death is something that affects us all regardless of your traumas and your your background and your your histories and coming to terms with that is something that everyone has to deal with no matter who you are um yeah it did not help that my grandmother also passed away like the week before I started reading this book. <laughs> so it was like, uh, like uh, my relationship with my grandmother is very different from Little Dog's relationship with his grandmother, simply because I did not grow up with my grandmother and we had an ocean between us. So relationship wise, very different, but also like emotional impact is relatively the same so i feel like reading the last part was was especially hard this time around and you know like i feel like everybody experiences loss especially as you get older like people leave you rather than uh people coming into your life so um it depends on like your age when you're reading this book i feel like you feel that last part even more yeah, I mean, all of my grandparents have, have passed away over the last few years. And there's something about just losing family members that really affects you. Especially if you come from an immigrant family, because like you said earlier, like our fam- like our grandparents and great-grandparents, they experienced war because that's 
pretty much what it means to live in Asia <laughs> because <laughs> like it was a constant state of war, whether it's, you know, war with other countries that were trying to colonize you or civil war. And you just think about how how much pain and how many how many struggles they endured. And, you know, they endured it for a long time, for a lifetime, and to just see that life gone. Um even if you don't have like a close relationship with your grandparents, um, you feel their absence. And I feel like this book did a really good job um, just kind of giving that hollow feeling after someone leaves you and just kind of like the stillness of like accepting that. Cause like you need a moment to like process that loss and, I feel like that book really, that part of the book really articulated it very well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to say that I was not smart enough to analyze this book at <laughs> all. Uh, I feel really bad because this book okay. is like, I think we did. I don't okay. <laughs> think so. Cause like, I, I was just like, man, the, the book is like so poetic and raw and I understand like the themes, but I feel like I don't really understand the themes and I feel like, I just feel like I don't have the language equipped to talk about this book. So I apologize to people <laughs> who are listening to this episode and are just like, ah, they didn't really nail it. And it's like, well, I tried my best. I think we, I mean, dear listeners, um, please, please send us encouraging messages if you, if you thought we did okay in this little discussion. Um, I will say as we get to the end of this episode, um, that I did notice that throughout the book, Ocean does invoke a lot of, allusions and metaphor to things like the monarch butterfly and the names Lan and Hong, which is his grandmother's and mother's names, are the Chinese slash Vietnamese words for lily and for rose. And there was that line where he says that, you know, flowers are most beautiful right before they die, right? And there's just this theme of just, the title of the book is On Earth for Briefly Gorgeous. And the book is filled with metaphors of things that are briefly gorgeous on earth and i thought that was really you know there's probably some like we were said literary um, analysis <laughs> for that but to me i thought that was really i guess big brain of him for lack of a better word um, i think there was like a line about like the monarch butterfly saying like the parents don't return back to where they came from in terms of migration patterns is the children that goes back. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's like similar to immigration. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, very big brain. And I definitely don't have the big brain to to talk about it. This is why, like, I'm not an English major. <laughs> this is why we stick to cozy mysteries and, <laughs> and genres. This is why I stuck to... Um, like writing essays about films rather than books <laughs> because I like I feel like I'm just like not it's especially with poetry too I just feel like I don't get a lot of the metaphors they kind of like float past my head but I really appreciate the fact that we read this book because it did challenge my brain I mean I think the act of reading it whether or not you can articulate those feelings and those thoughts um, reading this book was affecting and you know it the way that ocean writes is so like beautiful and also visceral that it paints all sorts of pictures in your head and invokes a lot of feelings as you're reading it and i thought that experience of reading it you know even if you don't might not necessarily relate to everything will affect your worldview in one way or another right whether or not this is the first time you're reading a refugee immigrant narrative or if it's just like your your third or fourth time reading it the way that he writes with such specificity and such um a clear and i guess keen um observational eye is you can't i don't think unless you just don't like reading you, there's no way you can <laughs> read this book and not come away with like some sort of feeling at least you know yes yes <laughs> this book is definitely more about emotions than linear plot um yeah, like not a fan of stream of consciousness most of the time. Like I'm thinking about like the sympathizer, which is also about like <laughs> like the Vietnam refugee experience and war and how like that was really difficult for me to like wade through. But then with this book, I feel like because it was so poetic, there were definitely like 
beats, right? Yeah. It's just like, oh, yeah, there's a pause in between these lines. <laughs> there's a rhythm to it. So definitely it was rhythm, easier to definitely process. Definitely, like, it's, you know, it's almost like it's, it's in verse. You know, it's each part is is a poem, even though they're also connected as a narrative. Um, yeah, I think, you know... <laughs> I would really like to, if there's an audiobook of this, of Ocean reading, I would probably want to I think he does read the audiobook. The oh, okay, he yeah. does, yeah. I think I would benefit more from listening to it than mm. reading it, simply because I read it too quickly, <laughs> and it would be nice to just read it in the original rhythm and pacing that the author set it out to be. Yeah. Well, any final thoughts on On Earth or Briefly Gorgeous? Um, I'm glad that we read it. I was really scared <laughs> about reading it. Um, it was funny because we were trying to think like what we were going to read for November. And I was just like, I don't know, like, do we read genre fiction again? Or, you know, are we going to read something a lot shorter because of the holidays? And I just looked at my kindle library and i was like oh i have this book and i'm never gonna read it unless i'm forced to read it because <laughs> it's totally out of my wheelhouse i happened to buy it because it was on it was on sale so i was like okay yeah this is a good opportunity to read it and i hope it was a good opportunity for you guys to read it because sometimes we all need a push to read more challenging works definitely i mean this is a book that has been in the TBR pile for a long time because it's a book that much like um my um um much like minor feelings it's a book that's always you know recommended as as like one of the books to read but it's always been in the middle of that TBR pile for precisely <laughs> that reason that I don't know if I'm equipped or ready to approach it so um thank you Rira for making me read it as well um, yeah. Now I can, you know, now I can bring it up at dinner parties and and, and be all intellectual <laughs> about it. Um, but yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. Um, it definitely was a different type of book that um, compared to what I typically read. But I am glad that I read it. And I'm glad that, you know, I can say that I've read it now, too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, that will do it for our discussion of On Earth, We're Beautifully Gorgeous by Ocean Vong. Um, let us know what you think of the book in our Goodreads forums. We always love to hear uh, feedback from our audience. Um, Rira, what's our next book club pick for um, the month of December? I guess and slash January. Uh, and slash January. <laughs> I think we're going to read this book until like the middle of January, but we shall see. <laughs> um, but this time around, we're reading something that is in your wheelhouse, Marvin. We are reading She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. And it is described as Mulan meets the Song of Achilles. And it's a bold, queer, and lyrical reimagining of the rise of the founding emperor of the Ming Dynasty. So, oh. yeah, definitely in your wheelhouse because <laughs> you love Asian-inspired fantasy. I've definitely heard of this book so i'm excited to, to to finally break it open and read it i have a lot of fantasy on my plate for this month too because i'm also in the middle of reading through jade legacy jade legacy <laughs> which is um i don't know what it is about fantasy trilogies but they get exponentially larger every iteration um i, I also, think about how like it, it took fonda seven years to write jade legacy and it's <laughs> like yeah and then there's people like Marvin who probably binge read it within like three days. And it's like, oh, <laughs> seven years of work <laughs> being like. That's why it's good. I can sit down and finish it in three days. I wouldn't do that for any book, you know? That's true. That's true. Um, the Veiled but, Throne, the third book of the Dandelion Dynasty is also coming out this month, which I, I haven't even looked at the page count, but I'm sure it's longer than, than Wall of Storms. <laughs> I haven't read Wall of Storms. I really should because I am a completionist and <laughs> really should read that. Oh, um, yeah. Anyway. You, you can borrow my copy, like you, just like you borrowed my, my I copy know, for of like, uh, Grace of Kings. Grace of Kings was also one of those books where I was like, 
I don't know if I'm equipped to read this. And it was just in my pile for the longest time ever until Marvin was like, we are going to read this book for book club (laughs) because otherwise we are never going to talk about it. And I I was like, yes, you are right. (laughs) I think you'd like the second book better than the first one because it does feature better um, female characters. More women. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But we're we're not discussing that right now. Uh, Maybe in the future bonus episode or something. But uh, yeah, um, looking forward to reading She Will Be King the Sun. Um, as we were mentioned, this will be the book club pick for um, December and January, um, just because it's the holidays. We're all taking them. You know, um, we were and I both kind of want to take it a little easy during the holidays. Um, so I guess essentially we're kind of taking December off and giving you a heads up on our January pick. In, in, a, in, yeah, in a way. like we we need vacation time, too. <laughs> But um, we we will be doing like news episodes, so it's not like we're going away completely. Yeah, and we also have a great interview with Julie too, the author of the Donor Trap, coming up um, next week as well. So uh, we're still we'll still be releasing episodes. Uh, we're just going to take our time with this next book. Yes, and catch up on some of our TBR <laughs> to give uh, Marvin enough time to read Jade Legacy yeah. and me with my 20 books that are just sitting on the floor of my apartment because i have not touched them yet (laughs) so we shall see maybe maybe we'll do a catch-up episode on all the things that we read during our break (laughs) sounds good yeah all right well um we thank you for discussing on earth for briefly gorgeous with me and our audience um thank you to our audience for tuning in and we'll see you next time on books and boba happy holidays everybody bye Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. We're still here, and we're going strong. It's an exciting time in Asian America. There are more movies, TV shows, books, and music reflecting us than ever. But all of these represent just a small slice of Asian American culture and experiences. So what do we do? Tell more slices. Asian Americana is a show that explores these slices of distinctly Asian American culture and history. We've talked about how Chinese Americans built California's Sacramento Delta, the art scene turns gallery institution giant robot, a play that explores the lost Cambodian pop music of the 60s and 70s, and, of course, Boba, just to name a few stories. You can find Asian Americana at asianamericana.com or on your podcast app.